Hi, I'm Jim. Welcome back to my lab here at Lawrence Tech and another video on the fundamentals of airfoils and lift. Um, last video I talked about Newton versus Bernoulli and showed algebraically that you can get from Newton's second law to Bernoulli's law with a little bit of algebra. Um, you know, this being a very generic law that applies to all kinds of objects from air to planets in their orbits. This being a very specific application of Newton's laws and conservation of energy um, that apply to fluid flow along a streamline in ideal gas. But today I want to talk about fairy tales, okay? If you're a pilot, chances are that somewhere along the way you've been told about how an airplane generates lift and chances are what you were told is a fairy tale, okay? Just basic uh, bovine excrement. So I'm going to talk about some of those fairy tales, you know, airfoils curved on the top, flat on the bottom, uh, Bernoulli on the top, Newton on the bottom, it's like a Venturi. That's all nonsense, just complete utter nonsense, and I'll show you why, okay? And then in the end we'll talk about a simplistic, but fundamentally correct explanation of why airfoils generate lift, okay? And I should be clear before we jump into this, um, I am not an FAA certified instructor of any type. Nothing in this video is going to help you pass an oral or written exam from the FAA, okay? I'm just a dumb old engineer who's been rolling this around the back of his head for a long, long time until I finally got it to a point where I think I have it organized and understandable, okay? And uh, I thought I'd present it, so here we go. Fairy tales for children usually start out with once upon a time long, long ago, okay? And you pretty much know when you hear that opening phrase, you're going into a fairy tale. Fairy tales for pilots typically start off with a wing is curved on the top and flat on the bottom, okay? And I'll give you an example here from this web page. I'm not giving you the link to that web page in order to protect the guilty, um, but it basically says that a wing produces lift because of its shape, specifically because in its most basic form it's curved top and it's flat bottom. Okay, um, If that were true, if a fundamental property of an airfoil is that it has a flat bottom and a curved top and that's how it generates lift, then you would think, I mean, at least I think it would make sense, that an actual airfoil in use would have a curved top and a flat bottom, right? Does that kind of make sense? If, if you have to have a curved top and flat bottom, that you would have a curved top and flat bottom? Let's look at some, okay? I collected a data from a number of airfoils from the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign, database okay, of airfoils. Here's one, the NACA 1412 from, as used on a decathlon. Um, curved top, curved bottom. Now you might argue that this is a special case because the decathlon is designed for aerobatics and it has to work upside down and you, know, you have to act, operate at an angle of attack and the air is going to separate here instead of up here and that sort of thing. So. How about an airplane that's designed to fly strictly shiny side up, get a number of people from point A to point B with a, in a reasonable amount of time. Brand new, they cost a metric pile of money. Uh, the King Air, right? To an engine turboprop. And as you can see, there is the airfoil, uh, nicely curved on the top, nicely curved on the bottom. Now you would think if a flat bottom curved top were a fundamental property, it wouldn't look like this, would you? Uh, Cessna 310, another shiny side up people mover. Curved, top and bottom. Cetabria, well there we go. Here's something, it's pretty flat on the bottom, right? What happens when we fly upside down? Now the flat is on the top, the curve is on the bottom. How does that work? Mooney, uh, the Mooney, uh, I got Mooney Encore here with the NACA 63215. Um, actually almost every Mooney uses this airfoil. Okay, again. Curved on the bottom, curved on the top. It's hard to see which surface actually has more curve. It's pretty close. 
How about a airplane designed to just to haul a lot of weight for its size? You know, a Cherokee 6, that's, you can put a lot of stuff in a Cherokee 6 given the size of airplane it is, so that's got to have a pretty strong lifty wing, right? So it's going to adhere to those lifty wing principles, and when you look at it in cross-section, you get that. Again, curved on the top, curved on the bottom. Now, there are some airfoils that are pretty flat on the bottom. Cessna 172, if we tilt that just a little bit, you know, the, it's pretty straight, uh, particularly back here behind the strut. You know, the only curve on the bottom is pretty much in front of the strut, and that's pretty straight. Piper Cub uses a modified version of the USA 35B. And again, that is, that's real flat along the bottom and, and curved on the top. So yes, there are some airfoils that are flat on the bottom and curved on the top, but certainly not all of them. It's certainly not a fundamental property of an airfoil. And you saw in the beginning of the video, you saw that little glider flying, the Hobbytown version of the Gullo Balsa glider, right? Uh, there's the gullo, that flies as well too. Uh, this one's harder to video when you're working by yourself because it, when the propeller makes a turn and you just, it's just too hard to follow. It's just too hard to launch and follow with a camera. But, you know, again, here's, here's the airfoil, right? It is flat on the bottom, but it's equally as flat on the top, right? And it generates lift. You saw it at the beginning of the video, it flies quite nicely. And again, so if, if a flat bottom curved top were a fundamental aerodynamic principle that generated lift, you'd expect wings to have flat bottoms and curved tops, and in fact, they don't. So I think, I hope, we can consider that myth busted. Another popular myth is the equal transit myth that says that, well, Rather than me explaining it, I'm going to insert a clip here from a very talented, capable pilot that I'm going to not name and not give you a link to in order, again, to protect the guilty, but uh, let's go with that. Now basically the way that works is, imagine that two little air molecules are holding hands and they're going to come up together and they hit the leading edge of this wing and they get split apart, okay, and one goes over the top and one goes over the bottom and when they come back they got to hold hands at the same time because the air has got to you know basically uh, reconnect to itself. Now to be clear uh, that unnamed pilot did say there are two parts to lift and he said you know, part of it was also deflecting air downward which you can feel when you stick your hand out the window okay um, so I'll, I'll give him that much but as far as the air getting to the trailing edge and having to hold hands like teenagers getting to the food court at the same time in the mall. Um, if that were true, okay, you could use that theory to prove that aircraft as we know them are incapable of flight, okay? Because rather than do the math here, I'm just going to pull up another reference. Because um, if that were true, this is what airfoils would look like, okay? Uh, they don't look like that, do they? Right? To get enough distance, difference between the top and the bottom, that's what you need, okay? And he did the math here on an actual wing, on a 172, um, you have to fly over 400 miles an hour to generate lift, to get it off the ground. Now if you own a 172, you may wish that it would go 400 miles an hour, but you probably know that it doesn't. So. Yeah, it's, it's beyond nonsense, okay? And in reality, um, this is a clip from a video from Cambridge University on YouTube. I'll put the link in the, in the description again. And in this, in this video that I took a still from, uh, you can see that the air on top is actually getting the trailing edge well ahead of the air flowing on the bottom. So you can go check that link out. It's, it's an interesting video. It's fun to watch, okay? There's nothing to say about that myth other than it's, it's absolute nonsense and it doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work mathematically, it doesn't work when you put it in a wind tunnel, it won't work when you're flying through the air. If you're a pilot, you've probably seen the theory about, you know, 
venturis and a wing looks like a cross section of a venturi and things like that. And probably one of the reasons you've seen it is even the FAA has used that as an explanation. Let me give you a clip from an FAA video from 1976. Let's see what they have to say. How do airplanes fly? We'll start with a double winged model in the airflow. The action of the air between the wings will demonstrate a basic principle of aerodynamics. Now, by animation, let's study the airflow in greater detail. First, note that its pattern suggests it is passing through a tube-shaped device. Next, notice that the entrance and exit of the device are the same size. We can measure the openings and find that the ends are each 10 square inches. The middle part is squeezed creating a throat of five square inches. Now, if we direct smoke lines through the device, its pattern will show that something happens to the air where it goes through the narrowed part. What we find is that when the air speed is 100 miles an hour at the entrance of the device, it is also 100 miles an hour at the exit. Yet at the same time, the speed at the narrow part is considerably higher. It can easily be understood, therefore, that the air increases in speed as it passes through the smaller opening. But the interesting thing is that in order for the air to go at the faster speed through the narrow part, something has to balance this change in velocity, this speed difference. What changes is the air pressure in the narrow part. This pressure is significantly lower than the pressure at either end. But what does this have to do with flying? If we cut the model in half, we would have a profile similar to an aircraft wing section called an airfoil. You can see how helpful it would be to lower the pressure over a wing. Why? So that the comparatively higher pressure under the wing would push or lift it into the area of lower pressure above the wing. That's part of how an airplane flies. So let's examine that in a little bit more detail. Here I have crudely drawn a Venturi. Uh, you know, the area is larger here, the area is smaller here, and as mentioned in the video, to get the same mass of air through that, the air has to go faster, okay? And in accordance with Bernoulli's equation, obviously the pressure is, is lower, okay? And in fact, the mass flow rate in pounds per minute, kilograms per minute, slugs per minute, whatever your choice is, is equal to the density of the air, rho, times the velocity times the area. And that's a constant, okay? The same value here, same value there. So I can say that at area one, rho one, v one, a one equals rho two, density two, v two, area two, okay? And I can rearrange this, and if we assume that the density is approximately constant, which is the legitimate thing for subsonic airflow, okay, um, we can say that the velocity at the minimum area, V2, is equal to V1 times the ratio of area 1 over area 2. And if you are a pilot, you've probably heard of Mooney aircraft. Um, here's an example of one of the Mooneys, okay? A three view, you've seen that, I hope. Um, let's see, let's apply this Venturi theory to the wing of a Mooney. Okay, so here I've taped up the cross section of the wing of the Mooney. I've drawn that line, dividing it in half. Um, so the you know, upper part here looks like our Venturi, and we know from the Venturi equation that the velocity at this maximum restriction here is going to be equal to the equal to v1 which is a velocity here before we get to the wing times the ratio of the area in front at the front of the wing versus the area at this point here okay let's run some numbers now above this wing okay um, we've got about 300,000 feet of air before we get to outer space so our area okay is 300,000 feet times the wingspan of the Mooney, which is 35 feet, okay? And that gives me an area of A1 equal to 
500,000 feet squared. Okay? Now, at, air, at point two, because this is about uh, 0.38 feet from the, from the center line up to the top, my height is now 200, between here and outer space is 299,999.62 feet times that 35 foot wingspan gives me my A2, which is equal to 10,000. So that is equal to 10,400, or 10,499,999.62 square feet, okay? If I take the ratio of those two numbers, I can calculate that my velocity over the top equals the velocity V1, the velocity at the leading edge, times 1.0000013. Okay? So if 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 V1 is 100 miles an hour, like it might be, you know, right after liftoff, I calculate V2 is 100.00013 miles per hour. Okay? So a difference in velocity of, of 0 0.00013 miles per hour, you can plug that into Bernoulli's equation in both cases and see how much pressure difference there is, and the answer is not very much. Okay? But wait, there's more. Okay, what about underneath the wing, right? Um, let's suppose we have a Mooney and we're about to depart. We line up on the runway, we put the throttle to the firewall. Um, a Mooney has fairly short gear, so it's probably, you know, somewhere about like that, maybe. Excuse my crude drawing, which puts the runway about there, okay? Um, underneath the wing, it, it varies a little bit, you know, because of the dihedral, but I come up with a number of about three feet on average, right? So that gives, so underneath the wing, this area, is our three feet times 35 foot wingspan is 105 square feet going into the wing. And underneath here, it's not quite as curved as it is on the top. My, that's my A1. A2 equals about 2.71 feet because of that curve times 35 and that's equal to 94.8 square feet, okay? And that gives me my velocity here equal to V1 times, when I take the ratio, 1.107, okay? Now here it was times 1.0000013, here it's 1.107, almost a 10% increase in velocity compared to a, uh, not even a fraction of a one percent, you know. Um, so what does this tell us, right? This is actually very important, useful information because this explains why Mooney has struggled all these years financially, why they're, you know, flirting with bankruptcy, why their sales volumes are so low, because when you try to take off, the suction underneath is so much stronger than the lift on top, according to the Venturi theory, that Moonies can't fly. And you'd have to be an idiot to buy one, right? Why would you buy an airplane that you can't fly, right? If all you can do is taxi it around, because the faster you go, the more suction there is holding you to the runway. Either that or this Venturi theory is total garbanjo, okay? And if you own a Mooney, uh, let me know. Is it possible to fly with? You know, I've never flown one, so I don't know. Put, it, put something in the comments. Do you believe the Venturi theory, or do you believe you can fly? So let's talk about Newton versus Bernoulli. That's another whole topic of fairy tales and nonsense. Uh, but before we can get there, uh, we need to be real clear about Bernoulli, okay? Uh, Daniel Bernoulli was a mathematician early 1700s to late 1700s, did most of his work on the hydraulics in the mid-1700s, uh, 
His father, Johann, was also publishing works on hydraulics. He was a friend and student along with uh, Leonhard Euler around the same time. Um, they did a lot of good work and there are some sources that say that it was actually Euler that came up with what we know as Bernoulli's equation. But in any case, this, this stuff was happening in the middle of the 1700s. Okay? At the time, the idea of a airfoil with the flat bottom and curved top that we usually um, gets misattributed to Bernoulli, that didn't exist. This kind of shape was, essentially, was initially developed in the about the middle of World War I, 1915, if memory serves me correct. I could be off by here. Um, so Bernoulli obviously didn't deal with this, okay? There were sails at the time, you know, sailboat sails, uh, sails on windmills, things like that. But those were basically flat pieces of cloth that may or may not have had some, some degree of curvature. But when you start talking about Bernoulli, talking of, uh, claiming that air going over the top of a curve has to get to the trailing edge at the same time as the air that went under the curve, which we know is nonsense because it doesn't do that. Bernoulli never said that. Bernoulli had nothing to do with that. You know, Bernoulli was talking about general hydraulics and flows of fluids and gases, okay? Um, and this, when we talk about Bernoulli's equation, Bernoulli's principle, Bernoulli's law, whatever you want to refer to it, that's this, this right here, okay? Pressure plus density times velocity squared over 2 times density times acceleration of gravity times the height of a, of, of a fluid is a constant, okay? And for aerodynamic purposes and flow over wing and lift, this term is pretty negligible. So we typically just neglect that, okay? And in my previous video, I left that term out as well, okay? So for our purposes of aerodynamic discussion, this is Bernoulli's principle, okay? It's got nothing to do with length, okay? It's got nothing to do with curves. It's just a relationship between pressure, potential energy, velocity squared, density times velocity squared over two, kinetic energy, conservation of energy. That's Bernoulli's principle, okay? Now you may have been told other things were Bernoulli's principle, but again, you were told a fairy tale, okay? Somebody lied to you. You don't need to keep believing that. Okay, so let's talk about Newton versus Bernoulli, okay? Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. His first law, of course, is that objects that in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects at rest tend to stay in rest. And the third law, uh, for every action, is an equal and opposite reaction. Bernoulli's law again, Bernoulli's principle, pressure, Density, velocity over squared over two is a constant. Okay, again, that's that's it. That's the real Bernoulli. Okay, I know your flight instructor probably told you something. Now imagine, if you would, that we're out somewhere and we've been blowing soap bubbles. Okay, and we have all these soap bubbles floating along gently in the breeze. Okay, um, each soap bubble contains a bit of mass. Okay, there's air inside that soap bubble and it has mass, so it has inertia, okay? Uh, the mass, if you want to accelerate that mass, you have to apply a force, Newton's second law. If it's moving, it tends to stay moving. First, first law, if we apply a force against that mass of air, there's that equal and opposite reaction, third law, okay? Newton's laws apply to these bubble, soap bubbles floating across the sky. And as they float along on their streamline, we can use Bernoulli's equation to relate the pressure and velocity as conditions change over time, as conditions change as it flows along, okay? Bernoulli's laws apply to this one, Bernoulli's laws apply to this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, okay? Newton's laws, again, this, 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 right? That's just the basic fundamentals of physics. Uh, Newton's law is one of the very 
basic fundamental equations of classic physics, okay, you can't, it doesn't go away, okay? Now, what your flight instructor may have told you um, is that Newton's law accounts for lift on the bottom of a wing. So Newton's laws apply here, and Bernoulli's equation or Bernoulli's principle accounts for the lift generated on the top of the wing, and Bernoulli's principle is, uh, you know, 60% of the lift or some number, whatever the number was, it was wrong. Um, you know, and we have different physical principles operating here and here, okay? Um, in the words of Mark Twain, don't believe everything you hear on the internet. If this were true, if, if Newton's laws apply down here, and Bernoulli's equation or principle applies up here, okay, that implies that Newton's law doesn't apply to these soap bubbles here. All of a sudden, a minute ago, Newton's laws apply to all of these soap bubbles. Now we insert an airfoil here, an airfoil that didn't exist at the time of Bernoulli. We insert this airfoil and all of a sudden Newton's laws, one of the fundamental laws of classic physics, no longer applies, right? Because it's Bernoulli controlling this, not Newton. So somehow these soap bubbles are accelerating and moving and changing pressure without forces applied or without the action and reaction. Um, how does this make sense? How do the fundamental rules of physics change just because we inserted a airfoil there? That's an extraordinary claim, okay? That's huge, I mean, that's, that's earth shaking. That's an extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary proof, okay? that somehow the fundamental laws of physics don't apply because Bernoulli's law applies instead to, gen to account for the lift, okay? Whoever told you that this is Bernoulli and that's Newton, Bernoulli's law doesn't apply down here all of a sudden, Newton's law doesn't apply up here all of a sudden just because of this wing, um, can you prove that? Can you do the math? Do you have data, anything? I know you don't, okay, and I know that you can't prove it because it's simply not true, okay, and because I can get from here to here using algebra and or calculus, okay, that's what Bernoulli and Euler and those guys did, okay, um, it's nonsense. If it were true, you would find things in the reference books, engineering text, when you do fluid dynamics and computational fluid dynamics and things like that, you'd have to use different equations on top of the wing, different equations on the bottom of the wing. You won't find that in here. Not no way, not no how. Or suppose instead of a wing, we had a rock, right? Does the presence of a rock suddenly change the laws of physics above and below? Why would it happen, right? It's no more likely to happen with a rock than it is with an airfoil, or vice versa, right? So if you want to make a comment down below explaining what well, I was taught that Bernoulli's law applies on the top and Newton's law applies on the bottom, and they're different, and you know the lift over the top is this much, and the lift on the bottom is that much, and that's what I was taught, and fine, I believe you, you were taught that. I expect that you were taught that, okay? But can you prove it? Do you have data? Did the person who taught you that have data to support that or math to support that? Or are they just telling you stories and you've chosen to believe that in spite of the fact that it doesn't even make sense, okay? Because again, I can do the math. I have done the math. I did it in the last video. Go look at that. I'll put the link in the description along with all the other videos I've done. Two sides of the same coin. If, if this is true, if Bernoulli's equation is true on top of the wing, if 
you want to argue that Bernoulli's equation applies to the top of the wing, since Bernoulli's equation is just a special case of Newton's laws, okay, um, then you have to argue that Newton's laws apply up here just as equally, and you have to argue that Bernoulli's equation applies down here, because you can't have one without the other when you're talking about an inviscid, incompressible ideal fluid, which is what Bernoulli's law applies to, moving along the streamline, okay? They both have to apply on the top, they both have to apply on the bottom, if Newton's law applies on the top and on the bottom, you can't say that 60% of the lift is due to Bernoulli because, hey, there's Isaac, right? You can't say that 40% belongs to Newton because, hey, here's Danny Boy down here, okay? They're both applicable equations within the limitations and assumptions that are behind this equation. Both apply top, both apply bottom. There is no versus. For there to be a versus, one of them would have to not apply either on top or on the bottom. There would have to be a fundamental change in the laws of physics because you inserted an airfoil into this picture. Okay? So don't tell me, well, this is what I taught, so it must be true, unless you can come up with a really good, valid reason why the laws of physics change between here and here. And I know you can't, okay, because they don't. And the other problems with this idea that somehow this is Bernoulli and that's Newton, what happens when there is no curve, right? That's our airfoil. Do the laws of physics change because, because we inserted this into the, into the picture, right? It's flat. It flies. It generates lift. You know, if you want to argue that the laws of physics are somehow different because this is not an airfoil, okay? Um, again, I'm going to ask you to do the math or show me the data, which you can't do, which you won't do because it's nonsense. This is an airfoil. It generates lift. No curves, okay? Or what happens if we try to fly upside down in our Cetabria, right? Now the curve is here. How, how does Bernoulli's equation know which side to apply to, right? You know, uh, is it, well, because the air splits here and it has to go further there, and that's shorter, you know, it's a function of the distance over the top and the bottom. Um, why? Right? Other than the, you know, air has to hold hands at the trailing edge, you know, um, because Mr. Air wants to meet up with his ex, okay? Uh, which is demonstrably false, okay? Other than that fairy tale, why would the difference make any difference? Where does this show about differences in distance, okay? Explain this. And if you can't explain it, if you can't come up with the math, if you can't come up with the data, if you can't explain it in terms of basic physics, then don't try to tell me that it's true, okay? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and, well, my flight instructor told me a fairy tale or my middle school teacher said this was true, um, doesn't cut it. It just does not cut it, okay? If the laws of physics apply above and below an airfoil, okay, and if we can generate lift with the flat plate, which, again, you saw this thing fly, okay? You know that it generated lift to make it over the camera there, okay? Um, Bernoulli's law applies here, Bernoulli's law applies there. What causes lift, right? That gets us back putting aside all of the fairy tales, all of the nonsense. Let's get down to some fundamental physics, apply Newton's laws, apply Bernoulli's principles, and come up with an explanation of lift that is consistent with Newton, top and bottom, Bernoulli, top and bottom, and real life. Another thing you might have seen, okay, uh, and I 
I know I've seen it in FAA literature from a long time ago, is, is this idea of a rotating cylinder and the flow around the cylinder and that rotation causes a lower pressure on the top, higher pressure on the bottom, and that results in lift. Um, that's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. That's, that's real. This, this is a scan of a page from Abbott and von Donhoff, Theory of Wing Sections, 1949. And back then, when men were men and engineers with slide rules ruled the world, okay? Um, I don't miss this. <laughs> it's fine as a novelty thing, but I do not miss using this every day. MATLAB is great. But anyhow, back then, when you had to do things with pencil and paper and slide rules, uh, there was a technique where you would take the pressure distribution or velocity distribution around a rotating cylinder and you could map it to the pressure distribution about an airfoil. That was a legitimate thing. But the problem with that explanation and when you're showing it to pilots is you show them this and you show them this and it's like, huh? What's the connection? You know, uh, a lot of really messy math, which I'll show you in a bit, okay? Um, yeah, so that's not a myth and we will come back to that, okay? So, can I give you a technically correct overview of how a wing generates lift? Now, let me give you a reasonable explanation of the basic principles of what causes lift, okay? Besides the money part of the equation, okay? Imagine, this is our airfoil. It's a simple airfoil. We already figured out that it doesn't have to be curved around the top, so why draw a curve when you don't need it, okay? And imagine that these are some of more of our soap bubbles just out there and we're flying towards those soap bubbles, okay? So those soap bubbles are going to move this way relative to the wing and they'll move along streamline, okay? So let's imagine that this bubble right here is going to flow along and it's going to flow along the bottom of the wing and when it gets to the trailing edge, it's going to keep going in the direction it was going, right? According to Newton's first law, objects in motion tend to stay in motion. It's going to keep going that same direction, you know, until it's pushed around by air from the ambient around it, okay? Um, that shouldn't be hard to imagine that air flowing along the bottom and keep going, right? And, you know, this is going to flow along somewhat parallel, okay? And over the top, one of two things can happen. One, this soap bubble can flow along and just kind of keep in a straight line, okay, if the air can't make that curve, and that's when a wing is stalled. As a pilot, you should be familiar with that. The other possibility is that the air will flow along the top of that wing, and when it gets to the trailing edge again, it's going to just keep going in the same direction, and, and, and these streamlines tend to be going the same direction, same speed, okay? And, but now, instead of just being horizontal with, with the vertical velocity equal to zero that we start out with, we have now a net vertical velocity downward, okay? So the air has been accelerated. We've changed the velocity. It's been accelerated, and according to Newton's law, the second law, force equals mass times acceleration, we've accelerated, that means we had to apply a force. So if we've applied a force downward on the air, that means Newton's third law, the air has applied a force upward on the wing. Okay? Action, reaction, and that's left, but no curves required as the title of the last video might have suggested. No curves required. Does that mean that Bernoulli doesn't count? Not at all, not at all. Um, we know that if we had our soap bubble here, okay, and it was traveling just horizontally and now it's traveling at some angle downwards, I had to accelerate it downwards, right? That means there had to be a force applied to that soap bubble. And for fluids, force comes in the form of pressure, okay? So it means the pressure on the top of that bubble had to be higher than the pressure on the bottom of that bubble, okay? And as we go out away from, from our airfoil, you know, this is essentially the ambient. The ambient pressure, if we get far enough away, 
which is the same as the pressure was here, okay? So that means for a pressure to be higher, lower here and higher there, the pressure on the top of the wing has to be lower, low pressure, right? And that's what pulls the wing up. Same thing on the bottom, I've taken this soap bubble, I've accelerated it downwards, that means that the pressure on the bottom of the wing has to be higher than ambient. So if we've reduced the pressure here, according to Bernoulli's law, if the pressure times the density times velocity squared over 2 is a constant, to reduce the pressure to keep that constant, we had to increase the velocity. So the air going over the top is fast, and on the bottom, the pressure is higher. That means the velocity is slower, okay? And we saw that in that little screenshot I took of the video with the smoke puffs going over the top and on the faster than the smoke puffs coming on the bottom, right? And this is a legitimate picture. Here is a picture from NASA Langley's wind tunnel from 1930s, okay? And if you look at it, it's not quite a flat plate. They got a little, a little bit of curve up in the front so that they can get a higher angle of attack without stalling, get the air to go around that corner better. But you can see the air flowing along the bottom of the airfoil is flowing along the bottom of the airfoil. It's, de it's deflected downward. The air flowing along the top of the airfoil is flowing along the top. It's not going straight anymore. It has that net deflection downwards, okay? And then, according to Bernoulli, we know that it is lower pressure faster. There is no versus. It isn't Newton on the bottom, Bernoulli on the top. It's Newton on the bottom, Newton on the top, Bernoulli on the top, Bernoulli on the bottom. Both equations apply everywhere, okay? The laws of physics don't change depending on which side of an airfoil you're on, okay? That's a fact. So if this is all it takes to explain in broad strokes how a wing generates lift, why all the mythology, right? Um, to be honest, I don't know. And I don't, well, I've got a theory, we'll get to that, um, as to when it happened, okay? Certainly the Wright brothers didn't buy into this flats and curves because their airfoils didn't look anything like that. And here's an example of some very early airfoils these top three here are pretty much what was happening going into World War I, and you can see they're all very thin airfoils, all under, pretty much under cambered, and that was the standard for the time. Um, this bottom one here is the airfoil used on the Fokker triplane. That, to the best of my knowledge, is the first of the modern looking airfoils with that, with that flattish bottom and the curved top, okay? so. These myths about Venturi's and flat on the bottom, curved at the top, Bernoulli, all that, um, had to be post-World War I because before that it wouldn't have made sense given the shape of the actual wings, right? Um, my suspicion, you know, I gave you a very broad, simple explanation, but this is a really, really lousy model if you want to calculate an actual pressure distribution over the surface on Earth. This is just kind of the broad strokes. On average, it's lower pressure. On average, it's higher pressure. You know, it doesn't tell you a lot of the details. So if you went to an aerodynamicist, okay, um, and again, I'll pull out some pages from 1948 again, and started asking about this, um, they will show you things like lifting lines Okay, where we have bound vortices going this way and vortex filaments going that way and all this and um, to explain that to a pilot who's quite frankly struggling with weight and balance, uh, good luck. The cylinder, the rotating cylinder, mapping it to an airfoil, um, that's a great way to explain circulation where you have a combination of a linear flow and a rotational flow. But again, it's not very intuitive, intuitive how you get from there to there, okay? And in fact, if you, there's two of the several pages of math that it takes to get from one to the other, right? 
I can imagine some writer trying to come up with an explanation to explain why somebody's Piper Cub stays in the air, looked at that math, and threw their hands in the air and said, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? And looked at it some more and said, gee whiz, that looks like a cross section of a Venturi to me, right? I can see that happening because when you try to get into the details, the math just explodes, you know. This derivation from Newton's second law to Bernoulli's equation that I did in the previous video, it took me a long time to figure that out, okay, without going through the calculus, without the really complex math. If you look in the references, for example, uh, Introduction to Flight by Anderson, um, the one place and only one place that he used calculus in this entire book, it's a, it's a very readable, straightforward, easy to follow book with some a lot of interesting historical snippets and stuff. Uh, if you're a pilot, you know, you can buy the E edition pretty cheap or an older edition of the book. Uh, I kind of, if you can find one for a decent price, buy it, you know. Uh, but the one place he uses calculus is to get from here to here, okay? And doing that without calculus, once you figure it out, like so many other problems, oh, it's easy, right? But it, it took me a long time to get all this sorted out in my head. And, um, yeah, so I, I can see why somebody might have resorted to fairy tales, but the fact of the matter is they're not necessary. You can lay this out. I think it's reasonably intuitive. I think it should make a certain amount of sense to a pilot without going into all the math. And it's not a fairy tale. I mean, the air is deflected. The air flows along that. Newton's laws applies. Bernoulli's equations applies. So I hope you found that somehow worthwhile. Um, I assume that I touched on whatever you were taught by your flight instructor and, and tried to poo-poo it. Uh, if I didn't, if there's some something you were taught on how a wing makes lift that I didn't cover, some other fairy tale, oversimplification, um, put a comment down below and I'll see what I can do about it, okay? But in any case, thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the flip side.